Whether as an Egyptian priest or the head of his own company, Sato Kaiba has stood as Yugi's eternal rival, and one of the only duelists capable of keeping up with the King of Games, opposing Yugi's belief in the heart of the cards by instead believing in the objective strength of his deck, and his skill as a duelist. And it's for this reason that Kaiba is so iconic and well-loved, because no matter how arrogant he is, Kaiba always has the dueling strength and coolness factor to back it up. Which is why we're going to look at Kaiba's 10 most iconic cards, how Kaiba used their strength to his advantage, and whether or not the power actually holds up in the real life game. And snapping into number 10 is La Jin, Mystical Genie of the Lamp, one of Kaiba's earliest beat sticks who also showcased Kaiba's tactical ability. As a beater, La Jin has an amazing stat line for a level 4 monster, with an impressive 1800 attack, which for a while made it one of the strongest low level monsters in the anime dwarfing some of the other iconic level beaters like Alligator Sword, a Gazelle, and even some of Kaiba's other strong monsters like Battle Ox. This made Legend an absolute powerhouse, with it becoming an even stronger tool after the events of Duelist Kingdom, since, unlike some of the other high attack monsters in Kaiba's deck, Legend didn't need a tribute to be brought out. But Kaiba didn't just use Legend as a strong beat stick, he also used it tactically, by combining its strength with Ancient Lamp, a card that not only let Kaiba summon Legion, but also allowed him to act as a powerful defensive wall capable of redirecting the attacks of your opponent's monsters towards their allies. Which turned out to be an important tool in Kaiba's second duel against Yugi, where La Jin and Ancient Lamp managed to take down the comparatively stronger Curse of Dragon by redirecting the attack of Yugi's Dark Magician. But La Jin and Ancient Lamp's most iconic moment was in Kaiba's duel against his father, Gozabura Kaiba, where they both were integral for the defeat of Exodia Necros since Ancient Lamp allowed for La Jin to be summoned to the field to provide enough tributes for Blue Eyes White Dragon, and La Jin's Fiend typing allowed for Kaiba to activate Soul Demolition, banishing all of the Exodia pieces from the graveyard to reduce the attack of Necros to zero, leaving it vulnerable to an attack, ultimately allowing for him to defeat his cruel adoptive father, and putting his awful childhood to rest. Unfortunately, La Jin and Ancient Lamp were never really as versatile in the actual card game, but both managed to see some minor success. Ancient Lamp was used in classic Monarch strategies as a way to ensure you have a tribute on your follow-up turn by using its redirect effect as a defensive option. And La Jin was once the best normal summon in the game due to its high stat line, which, just like in the anime, made it a solid offensive threat in the early days of Yu-Gi-Oh that was hard to contest. But as a pair, they've never really been played together. Ancient Lamp's swarming effect is definitely a cute reference to the genie, but it's too niche to really be useful. Especially because one of La Jin's strengths was that it was already easy to bring out to the field with a normal summon. But at the very least, it's really cool that both La Jin and Ancient Lamp saw playing the TCG for similar reasons to why Kaiba used him in the anime, with Ancient Lamp being a defensive option and La Jin being one of the game's primary offensive threats. But of course, only Seto Kaiba would have the genius to combine these two strengths into one strategy. And plugging into number 9 is Enemy Controller, one of Kaiba's most iconic quick play spells that came in clutch in the Battle City Finals. And a huge part of that is because of Econ's modularity and adaptability, which is evident in the TCG version of the card, which allows you to activate one of two effects, making it so that you can either change the battle position of an opponent's monster, or allow you to tribute one of your own monsters to take control of an opponent's. This is actually a simpler and nerfed version of the card in the anime, which required you to pay 1000 life points and enter a specific code to activate an effect. If you input up, down, left, right, A, enemy controller will cause a monster to destroy itself. If you input left, right, A, B, you can use Econ's effect to take control of an opponent's monster. And it's the second effect that made it such a useful tool in Kaiba's deck during Battle City, as he would use enemy controller in order to get an extra monster to tribute to threaten summoning either Blue Eyes White Dragon or the almighty Obelisk the Tormentor. Something that Yugi managed to delay in his Battle City duel against Kaiba, as after he used Change of Heart to steal Kaiba's X head cannon, Kaiba then stole back his monster ready to summon his Egyptian God card. And it was only through a lucky hit off of Light Force Sword that Yugi managed to temporarily stop Obelisk from entering the field. He also used the card in the runner-up duel against Joey Wheeler, stealing Joey's little wing guard and combining it with cost down to tribute summon Blue Eyes White Dragon from his hand. But in this duel, Econ's modularity was his downfall, because after Joey used the effect of Grave Robber to steal it, he inputted the destroy code to blow up Kaiba's Blue Eyes, which, even though it was used against Kaiba, managed to prove how versatile the card could be. And it's this versatility that has allowed Econ to see a ton of competitive play in the TCG ever since its release even though it's a weaker version of its anime counterpart. Its first effect is a neat battle trick that can be used to stop an opponent's attack. This can be important for conserving your life points, but stopping an attack also prevents certain effects from activating, or stopping your opponent from accessing a Zeus. But it's Econ's mind control effect that's the most relevant. Like other mind control cards, it's a great going second tool, and one that can force an opponent's interactions because otherwise you'd steal their boss monster to use its effects, 
or to use it as a material for a summon, just like what Kaiba did. And it's even great for going first, because you can just set enemy controller to use it like a trap card during your opponent's turn to steal one of their combo pieces, before they have a chance to use the monster for an extra deck play, making it a really powerful interruption, and one that's sometimes capable of ending an opponent's turn by itself. In general, enemy controller has a near infinite potential use, and the modularity has been an important tool in a ton of different strategies over the years, with its most powerful effect being its mind control ability allowing you to steal an opponent's monster and then use it for your own gain. Which is precisely how Kaiba Yuzi caught in the anime. And while most decks aren't summoning an Egyptian god, its strength in the TCG manages to mirror its anime counterpart, even despite being nerfed. And drawn at number 8 is Card of Demise, Kaiba's best combat card that's been an integral tool for his victory in some of his most important duels. Just like enemy controller, Demise has two versions, the busted anime version and the comparatively tamer TCG version. The TCG version allows you to draw cards until you have three cards in your hand but comes with a ton of downsides that prevents every deck from using it. Your opponent can't take damage for the rest of the turn, you can't spell summon monsters for the entire turn, and you have to discard your entire hand during the end phase. The anime version, though, allows you to draw until you have 5 cards in your hand, with the only downside being that you have to discard your entire hand during your 5th standby phase after you use it. Which isn't really a harsh downside, because it's unlikely this effect will ever resolve, since it's pretty easy to finish up most duels within 5 turns. A fact that Kaiba used to his advantage, because in the anime, Kaiba only ever had to discard once for Card of Demise during the Pyramid of Light movie. Which actually ended up being a benefit anyways, because it further increased the attack of Blue-Eyes Shiny Dragon. But of course, the main benefit of Card of Demise was that it allowed for Kaiba to draw a ton of cards to stage an insane comeback. With its most important use being in Kaiba's last duel against Siegfried von Schroeder the head of Kaiba Corporation's rival company that aimed to humiliate Kaiba and ruin Kaiba Corp's stock price, so that he and Schroeder Corp would be the number one games company in the world. Kaiba wasn't going to let this happen, and dueled Siegfried to officially disqualify him from the KC Cup. And although Siegfried got extremely close to winning with his Valkyrie strategy, Kaiba managed to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat with Card of Demise, which allowed him to draw five cards, which were enough to set up his banish zone and grab Dimension Fusion from his graveyard so he could summon out his Blue Eyes White Dragons and Chaos Emperor Dragon to attack for game. And this way of using Demise is really similar to how it's actually used in the TCG, and has given people the chance to drown in an overwhelming advantage so as long as they have few cards in their hand, which is why you'll see decks that play Demise committing their entire hand to the field so they can get as much advantage as they can out of a single activation. But because of the differences between the anime and the TCG version of the card, not every deck can play Demise since it prevents you from special summoning at all and its end phase effects means that you're guaranteed to lose every card in your hand. But that didn't stop a ton of different control strategies from playing it anyway, since it was virtually guaranteed to net you a ton of card advantage. And it was well worth the commitment of its downsides in decks like True Draco, which didn't need to special summon at all, and Cosmo, which could special summon during your opponent's turn, which let this nerfed version of Demise being limited in 2020. It's definitely not surprising that one of Kaiba's most busted comeback cards received such heavy nerfs in the TCG, but unlike other insane card draws like Card of Sanctity, Demise's nerfs weren't enough to stop it from being insanely powerful in the TCG, and one that definitely showcases that Kaiba knew what he was talking about when it came to strong cards. And pillaging into number 7 is Vorse Raider, one of Kaiba's strongest all-level monsters that act as one of Kaiba's most prominent offensive threats. And that's because, like La Jin, Vorse Raider was an incredibly strong, low-level beatstick that really represented Kaiba's belief in power, standing at an insanely powerful 1900 attack. This made Vorse Raider a powerful tool for Kaiba to use as an immediately strong monster that opponents would struggle to overcome due to its sheer attack power, and one that gave Kaiba a solid advantage in the early game of duels. Essentially, it was the truest definition of a beatstick. But, as we saw with La Jin, while Kaiba admired the pure power of his monsters, he wasn't dumb, and found a ton of creative and genius ways to use his vanilla beater, and its most interesting use being in Kaiba's Battle City duel against Ishizu, where he used Shrink on his own Vorse Raider in order to make it meet the requirements to activate Crush Card Virus. And once again, Kaiba's intelligent use of this card is really similar to why it's being played in the TCG. You see, by the time Voice Raider had actually been released in the real life card game, the days of Caveman Yu-Gi-Oh were over, which meant that for a while, Voice Raider never lived up to the offensive threat that it could have been. But after the release of Rescue Rabbit, Voice Raider skyrocketed in use, becoming a meta threat in decks like Fire Fist, which appreciated Voice Raider being a normal beast warrior with decent stats that they could use to instantly set up rank 4 plays. Although, what really brought Voice Raider over the edge was its dark typing. You see, since it was dark, Voice Raider was a valid target for Deck Devastation Virus, a trap card similar to Crush Card Virus that is capable of wiping out all monsters in your opponent's hand or field with 1500 or less attack, which could devastate certain strategies. The other normal Beast Warrior target was Earth, so it couldn't be used as Deck Devastation Virus. But, because Voice Raider was dark, if you managed to increase its attack by 100 points with something like a Fire Formation 10 key, 
you'd actually get to Mirror Kaiba almost exactly, and absolutely decimate an opponent's deck. For a card with zero effects, it's impressive how important Vorse Raider was in its particular niche. And even though lesser duelists may have treated Vorse Raider as a beat stick, those that were capable of thinking like Kaiba managed to find a use for this classic vanilla monster that manages to recapture its coolest moments in the anime. And biting to number 6 is the Fang of Critias, one of the three legendary dragon cards that chose heroes to wield them to defeat the evil of the Orichalcos. Tamias chose Yugi, Hermos chose Joey, and Critias chose Seto Kaiba. Which turned out to be an excellent choice, because the Fang of Critias lets you combine its power with a trap card, letting you send a trap card from your hand or field to the graveyard to summon a powerful fusion boss monster with an effect similar to the Sent Trap. This led to Critias being an important part of Kaiba's strategy during the Orichalcos arc, after he'd been chosen by the legendary dragon in his first duel against the Orichalcos agent, Alistair, who almost wiped out Kaiba after stealing two of his Blue Eyes White Dragons. But after a vision of Critias, Kaiba drew the legendary dragon and combined it with his crush card virus to form a Doom Virus Dragon, wiping Alistair's field and giving him a chance to counterattack before the duel ended in a draw. But the most important use of Critias was of course in Kaiba and Yugi's tag duel against Darts, where it was used to signify the trust held between the two rivals by combining Critias with Yugi's Mirror Force to form Mirror Force Dragon to wipe out Dart's Mirror Knights. But that's not all, because within this same duel, the Fang of Critias was eventually banished by Yugi with a Legend of Heart, after Kaiba's defeat, to bring out legendary Knight Critias, alongside Herbos and Tamias, all of which were integral in defeating Darts' infinite attack, Divine Serpent Gah. Now unfortunately, in the TCG, the Fang of Critias never quite reached the legendary status it had in the anime. Because while the effect of each of the dragons it could bring out were solid and mirrored the power of the trap cards they were based on, it was just a lot easier to use the trap cards themselves rather than trying to force out the fusion monsters. This meant that even the extremely powerful Doom Virus Dragon, whose effects mirrors Crush Card Virus before its errata, has never seen any actual play. Because while its effect can be game winning, it's just a lot easier to set up Crush Card Virus and a suitable tribute rather than hoping to draw it alongside Critias. And even Critias's most modern fusion monster, Destruction Dragon, is actively worse than just playing Ring of Destruction itself, because Destruction Dragon's effect is spell speed 1 and can't be used during your opponent's turn. So, unless you happen to be chosen by Critias, each of its forms are going to be fairly difficult to bring out. Still, there's no denying that despite Critias's lackluster TCG performance, it was still an amazing tool in Kaiba's arsenal that, in his own words, was comparable to an Egyptian god, and one that was necessary to defeat the Orichalcos. And far enough number 5 is XYZ Dragon Cannon, another mini-boss in Kaiba's toolbox that acted as his main machine-based menace. And for good reason, because XYZ Dragon Cannon is the ultimate formation of X Head Cannon, Y Dragon Head, and Z Metal Tank, and is one of the first fusion monsters in the game that didn't need polymerization, with its summoning condition instead requiring you to banish each of its component parts from the field. You can't special summon from your graveyard, but with no once per turn, you can't discard a card to target any card your opponent controls and destroy it, making it a really impressive removal option for its era. An option that Kaiba used to great effect against the likes of Pegasus in the Pyramid of Light movie, and Alistair in the Orichalcos arc. But Kaiba's coolest use of Dragon Cannon was definitely in its first appearance in the Battle City Finals, where he showed off the modularity of the light machines combining them to form the Dragon Cannon and wiped out Yugi's Big Shield Gardna. And then, after Light Force Sword had returned Obelisk to his hand, he sacrificed Dragon Cannon as three monsters in accordance with Battle City rules in order to bring out his Egyptian God Card. But despite how cool Dragon Cannon and its associated pieces were, they themselves haven't really seen any actual play in the TCG. Each of the individual pieces have lackluster effects, and it's difficult to bring each one of them out to the field to access their combo forms. But even though X, Y, and Z aren't that amazing in the TCG, there are still a number of ways you can embody Kaiba's use of this trio. In speed duels, these monsters were a meta threat when paired with Kaiba's skill union combination, which allowed you to banish the materials needed for your fusion monsters from the graveyard rather than the field, giving you a whole host of powerful removal options from your extra deck. Meanwhile, in the TCG, X, Y, and Z have a sister series of light machines composed of A, Assault Core, B, Buster Drake, and C, Crush Wavern, who, just like X, Y, and Z, combined to form the incredible ABC Buster Dragon. And this strategy has actually seen a ton of competitive play in the modern era due to how easy ABC is to access, since it also allows you to banish materials from the graveyard as well as the field, but also due to its two amazing effects, each of which mirror how Kaiba used Dragon Cannon in the anime, with its first effect being a great removal option for your opponent's cards and its second effect even allowing you to special summon out its component parts as if you were activating Dimension Fusion or Return from the Different Dimension, giving you enough materials to summon an Egyptian god. So despite X, Y, and Z not having seen any real competitive play in the TCG, it's really cool that their ideas and themes are still alive in the modern meta, since they're so well represented in ABC. 
and even though it's unlikely you'll be summoning XYZ Dragon Cannon anytime soon, these cards still allow you to mirror Kaiba's Machine Menace. Exploding into number 4 is Ring of Destruction, one of Kaiba's strongest trap cards that showed that he was willing to risk anything to win a duel, including his own life points. Because Ring of Destruction allows you to, during your opponent's turn, target and destroy one face that monster your opponent controls, whose attack is equal to or lower than their life points. Then you take damage equal to that monster's attack, and then after that, the same happens to your opponent. This is slightly different to its anime counterpart due to the number of erratas the TCG Ring of Destruction has received over the years, with the anime ring letting you activate it during either player's turn, target any monster on the field, and makes it so that both players take the damage at the exact same time. And as a result, ring was a really important part of Kaiba's toolbox, because it allowed him to remove some of his opponent's strongest boss monsters all while burning a decent chunk of their life points. But Ring is also somewhat reckless, because it burned both players, which meant that if Kaiba wasn't thinking properly, there was a chance that he could lose duels to his own card. But Seto Kaiba is a smart duelist, and so often paired Ring of Destruction with Ring of Defense, which protected Kaiba's life points while still letting Ring of Destruction destroy and burn their opponent. This combo was used a few times in the series, but featured most prominently in the four-way duel between Yugi, Kaiba, Merrick, and Joey, where Kaiba attempted to use Ring of Destruction on Joey's Axe Raider, while protecting his own life points with Ring of Defense, so that Joey would lose the duel so it would be more likely that he and Yugi would face off in the finals. Now, in the TCG, this kaiba patented combo was never really too relevant, because it's a specific two-card combo that's only going to be really useful in really niche situations. And what's worse is that the TCG version of Ring of Defense protects both players' life points, not just your own. But this never stopped Ring of Destruction from seeing competitive play by itself. And in the early days of Yu-Gi-Oh, it was one of the strongest trap cards in the game, since it could either be used to destroy an opponent's boss monster, or just end the game outright by burning your opponent for a ton of damage, or sometimes both at the same time, just like how Kaiba would use the card in the anime. And this meant that, for most of his life, Ring existed permanently on the Forbidden Limited list all the way up until 2015, where the card received an errata that made it a lot worse. This errata didn't make the card entirely useless, but it changed a lot about what Ring of Destruction so strong. You couldn't target a monster with an attack that was higher than your opponent's life points, nor could you target your own monsters either, which made it a lot harder for Ring to close out games with its burn effect. And because of the way its burn now applied, you had to take the damage before your opponent, which meant the card could no longer end duels in a draw, and could even potentially lose you the duel if you activate it while your life points were low. This led to Ring becoming a shell of its former self, and has never really reached the same height of competitive play as it saw prior to its errata with it only really popping up in niche burn strategies like Trickstar and Mystic Mine. But even though Ring is a lot weaker nowadays, you can still technically use it as Kaiba did in the anime, since it still lets you burn or remove an opponent's monster from the field. And there's no denying the legacy that Ring had on the TCG as one of the strongest early trap cards in the game. But Kaiba actually has multiple trap cards that were so busted that they had to receive an errata, such as the next card on this list. And infecting the number 3 spot is Crush Card Virus, Kaiba's strongest trap card that allowed him to destroy an opponent's entire deck. Now, Crush Card actually has multiple different versions depending on which series of the anime you're watching and what era you're looking at. But in the TCG, Crush Card Virus lets you tribute a dark monster you control with 1000 or less attack, so that you can look at all cards in your opponent's hand and all monsters on their field to destroy every monster your opponent has with 1500 or more attack. But your opponent takes no damage until the end of the next turn after Crush Card Virus resolves, and also lets your opponent destroy 3 monsters in their deck with 1500 or more attack. This is very different to Kaiba's anime version, which instead infected a dark monster you control with 1000 or less attack with the virus, so that when the monster was destroyed by battle, it would infect an opponent's deck. It would not only destroy every monster in their hand and on the field with 1500 less attack, it would also destroy those monsters in their deck as well. Now, in the anime, Kaiba often made fun of weaker monsters, but even he was willing to play monsters with low stats, such as Sagi the Dark Clown, purely just to facilitate Crush Card Virus. Which made perfect sense, because the moment Crush Card was used, every strong monster in your opponent's deck would be sent to the graveyard. To Kaiba, this meant that your opponent would only have weak monsters left in their deck, all of which would fall to his overpowered monsters. A strategy that proved fruitful in his Duelist Kingdom duel against Yugi, where Crush Card destroyed the likes of Gaia the Fierce Knight alongside every other monster in Yugi's deck, pushing the King of Games into a corner and forcing him to rely on his weak monsters to try and win in the face of the Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. But as powerful as Crush Card Virus was in the anime, there were also a number of times where it was turned against Kaiba, like in his duel against Ishizu Ishtar in Battle City, where after Kaiba had resolved Crush Card Virus, Ishizu used Exchange of the Spirit to leave Kaiba with only 6 cards left in his deck. And funnily enough, in the modern TCG, Crush Card Virus can be used against you, but in a different way to the anime, where instead of the effect being turned around onto you, like it was in Kaiba, your opponent will instead just gain a huge advantage by being allowed to foolish any 3 cards from their deck, letting them access a bunch of powerful graveyard effects. 
But this wasn't always how Crush Card Virus worked, because prior to its errata, it not only destroyed monsters in your opponent's hand and field, it also destroyed every card your opponent drew for three turns after it resolved, and didn't give your opponent a chance to destroy a card in their deck. This made Crush Card Virus absurd in the early days of the game, because even though it didn't destroy your opponent's deck, it would eviscerate every strong monster your opponent had on the field or in their hand, and kept them locked under a pseudo floodgate for three turns. That meant if they drew any powerful monster, it was just immediately sent to the graveyard. Which, for as oppressive as the card was, fits the same purpose that Kaiba used it for the anime, depleting your opponent of every powerful resource they had and forcing your opponent to rely on weak cards. However, because of its 2015 errata, Crush Card Virus no longer sees any real competitive play. Even though it has the potential to win you games, giving your opponent a chance to full us three monsters for free is just too big of a downside. But for a time, Crush Card Virus is one of the strongest and most oppressive cards in Yu-Gi-Oh! And crushing into number two is Obelisk the Tormentor, Seto Kaiba's signature Egyptian god card. Like Sliver, Obelisk's TCG version has a ton of effects designed to mirror the strength of its anime version. It requires three tributes of normal summon, its normal summon can't be negated, and neither player can activate cards or effects in response to that summon. Additionally, neither player can target Obelisk with card effects, and you can tribute two monsters to activate Obelisk's signature attack, Fist of Fury, by tributing two monsters you control, which destroys all monsters your opponent controls. But Obelisk can't attack the turn you use the effect. An Obelisk comes with the same downside as Slifer, where during the end phase, if it was special summoned, you have to send it to the graveyard. Now, just like the other Egyptian gods, the TCG version of Obelisk is a lot weaker than its anime counterpart. Because in the anime, Obelisk had a ton of other protections and effects that made it an absurdly overpowered boss monster, and one that only other Egyptian god cards were capable of defeating. Which is why Obelisk was deemed worthy enough by Kaiba to be his deck's main boss monster throughout the Battle City arc. Because unlike Yugi, who only used Slifer when necessary due to its immense strength, Kaiba constantly summoned out Obelisk throughout the arc in order to test its power, even against random no-name duelists. And each and every time, Obelisk proved why it was worthy of holding the title of an Egyptian god, giving the strength-obsessed Kaiba a taste of the power of the gods. As a result, Obelisk has a ton of iconic moments throughout the series, from its first appearance against Kaiba's dueling robot to Kaiba's duel against Ishizu. But out of all of them, Obelisk's coolest moment came from Kaiba's duel against Yugi in the Battle City semifinals, where we got to see Obelisk the Tormentor face off against Slifer the Sky Dragon, where the two gods collided, destroying each other in the process and causing both Yugi and Kaiba to see a glimpse of their ancient Egyptian past. Now, out of the three original Egyptian god cards, Obelisk is an anomaly in that it actually managed to see a decent amount of competitive play. You see, in the Dragon Ruler format, Obelisk was able to live up to its status as an Egyptian god due to its targeting protection. This, combined with its insanely high attack stat, made it so that the Dragon Rulers actually struggled to out the card, as their main sources of removal happened to target, and even their highest attack monsters couldn't stand out to Obelisk's mighty 4000 attack. Which is really cool that, even if only for a brief time, Obelisk was able to be the ultimate boss monster that Kaiba in the anime made it out to be, even if it was only for one specific format. But overall, Obelisk is a great representation of Kaiba's love of powerful cards, and one whose strength actually managed to transfer over to the TCG. But there is still one more card that represents Kaiba's love of strength even better than Obelisk, so much so that he was willing to sacrifice a god to summon it. And bursting into the number one spot is Dark Magician's eternal rival, Blue Eyes White Dragon. Kaiba's ultimate ace monster who holds the spirit of Kisara within it. Blue Eyes needs no introduction as it's one of the most iconic cards in the history of Yu-Gi-Oh. It's a level 8 vanilla beat stick with 3000 attack and 2500 defense, and doesn't have any effect due to it being a normal monster, and instead has flavor text that describes it as a virtually invincible monster. A statement that Kaiba truly believed as he constantly used Blue Eyes throughout the series as his main boss monster, using its power to eviscerate lesser monsters and duelists alike and believed in the power of Blue Eyes so much that he was even willing to steal and tear up Solomon Moto's copy of the card, leaving only three copies left in the world, all of which belonged to Kaiba. Just so the Blue Eyes' power could never be used against him, because to Kaiba, Blue Eyes represented distilled strength and his pride as a duelist, and he had so much faith in that pride that he dedicated a large portion of his deck purely around summoning and supporting as many Blue Eyes White Dragons as possible. With the likes of Lord of D with Flute of Summoning Dragon, Kaiser Seahorse, and even Cost Down all to facilitate to summon out the Engine of Destruction. But strangely enough, despite Kaiba's obsession with strength, Blue Eyes was more than just a monster to him, and he actually held a similar respect for Blue Eyes as a partner that mirrors Yugi's respect for the Dark Magician. Because Blue Eyes not only represents Kaiba's bond to his brother Mokuba, it also contained the spirit of Kisara, a slave that Pre Sento had freed who pledged her spirit to him in her death who would go on to serve Preseto and the modern-day Kaiba as the Blue-Eyes White Dragon. And these ideas of strength and spirit become one whenever Kaiba fuses each of his Blue-Eyes monsters into Blue-Eyes Ultimate Dragon, 
the combination of the spirits of Kisara, Priest Seto, and Seto Kaiba himself, that was even capable of standing up to Zork. And strangely enough, this power is well represented in the TCG, because not only have there been moments where Blue Eyes was meta, it was once the undisputed best deck of the format. So much so that it actually ended up winning a Yu-Gi-Oh! World Championship in 2016. And funnily enough, the way this championship was won was due to a monster that you would summon by combining the strength of Blue Eyes with Kisara. Blue Eyes Spear Dragon, a monster with a ton of effects that included a floodgate to stop two or more monsters from being summoned at the same time, which countered Pendulum Strategies, a Graveyard Negate which countered Burning Abyss, and even a Tag Out effect which could summon an Azure Eyes Silver Dragon from Yuxia deck, which allowed you to more easily bring the vanilla Blue Eyes to the field. And it was its effects combined that not only countered the other best decks of the format, but allowed for Blue Eyes White Dragon to have its own crowning moment as one of Yu-Gi-Oh!'s only World Championship worthy decks. Overall though, Blue Eyes White Dragon is an icon of both the anime and card game itself. And just like Yu-Gi's Dark Magician, showcases how strong the bonds between a card and a duelist can be. And this bond is one that a lot of people in the real life game form with the Blue Eyes. Because to a lot of people, while Blue Eyes does represent pure strength, it's also a fond reminder of their childhood and just how cool Seto Kaiba is. All right, and that's the list. Just like with Yugi's cards, it was really difficult to bring Kaiba's most important and iconic cards down to just 10 cards, and we've definitely missed a ton of other important ones, so a part two could definitely happen. So, if you'd like to see more videos like this one, let us know down in the comments below what you'd like to see. And remember to like the video, subscribe if you want to keep up to date on any future lists, and thanks for watching.